Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Mangna Nudal, I'm an airline captain with interest for aviation history. Today it's the 1st of April 2024. Exact one year ago I posted a video based on an article written by D. H. Yellamo. I told the story when Canada had a squadron on MiG-21. Of course, this never happened, and Yellamo is O'Malley spelled backwards. But the article is considered to be the best aviation hoax ever made. So here we have, in replay, the story about how Canada got a squadron on MiG-21. Happy April Fool's Day! In a previous video about the MiG-21, I explained how Finland became the first export customer. Well, I was wrong. Finland received the first MiG-21s in 1963. But many countries received the MiG-21 before Finland. They include East Germany, Indonesia, Romania, Canada... What? Canada? Yes, you heard me right. Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Magna Nordahl, I'm an airline captain with interest in aviation history. The 1950s saw rapid development in aviation technology. At the beginning of the decade, supersonic jet fighters were still on the drawing board. But 10 years later, five countries have developed interceptors that could exceed Mach 2. A speed twice the speed of sound. United States was the first with a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. Then followed the English Electric Lightning the Soviet MiG-21, the Swedish Saab 35 Draken, and the French Dassault Mirage III. A sixth country could have been on the list, because Canada had a project that had all the potential to outperform them all. After the Second World War, the relation between the Soviet Union and the West quickly deteriorated. And it didn't get better when the Soviet Union detonated the first atomic bomb in 1949. In 1951, the United States Air Force introduced the first modern jet bomber, the Boeing B-47 Stratojet. And a few years later came the B-52 Stratofortress, which is still in service today. The Soviet Union responded with the Tupolev Tu-95 and the Maisyshev M-4. The Cold War had become serious. The United States and Canada needed a defense against the Soviet bombers, which could attack the North American continent across the Arctic. The first line of defense was the Avro Canada CF-100. This was a subsonic fighter that barely could match the cruise speed of the Soviet bombers. But things developed quickly. In 1956, the Connor B-58 Hustler took to the skies for the first time, and this bomber had a top speed of Mach 2 and it was expected that the Soviets would follow suit, which they did, with uh, variable success. Anyway, it was evident that Canada needed a faster interceptor, and the answer was the Avro Canada CF-105 Arrow. The Avro Canada CF-105 Arrow was a large twin-engine interceptor with a delta wing. It was designed to exceed Mach 2, and there were even plans for a variant that could reach Mach 3. The Arrow was a very advanced aircraft for its time. It pioneered several engineering feats like fly-by-wire, 4000 psi hydraulic system, and the use of titanium, a metal that is very light and strong, but at that time was expensive and difficult to possess. The first Arrow was rolled out to the public on the 4th of October 1957. The test flights were promising, and few problems were encountered, and the aircraft went supersonic on its third flight. Later, it reached Mach 1.98 and 53,000 feet. And this was achieved with an interim engine that would be replaced with a more powerful engine developed in Canada, the Orenda Iroquois, which was still under development. Five aircraft were built, and by 1959, the test program was progressing towards the acceptance trials for the Royal Canadian Air Force, RCAF. But then Uncle Sam interfered. In 
1957, there was a general election in Canada and the governing Liberals lost the power to the Conservatives, led by Prime Minister John Diefenbaker. And things started to change. First, the Canadian government signed the North American Air Defense, NORAD, agreement with the United States, making Canada a partner with American command and control. At that time, the United States Air Force was in the process of automating the air defense system. And the system consisted of a chain of radar stations, powerful computers from IBM, and the Bomark anti-aircraft missile. This missile could carry a nuclear warhead, which was intended to explode in the middle of Soviet bomber formations. The Americans pursued the Canadians to buy this missile system, as this would move the radioactive downfall further away from the densely populated areas close to the border to the United States. But this system was very costly, and it became evident that Canada could not afford both the CF-105 Arrow and the American defense system. And then came Sputnik. On the 4th of October 1957, the very day the CF-105 Arrow was rolled out, the Soviet Union launched the world's first satellite, the Sputnik. The payload was a radio transmitter emitting a ping, ping, but the implications were huge. That meant that the Soviet Union would be capable to launch nuclear weapons via space, and there was no defense against it. And this changed a lot. Now the focus shifted from defense against bombers to building an arsenal of intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBM, and in addition to nuclear armed submarines and the bomber force, the idea was to defer the enemy from starting a nuclear war, as this would result in a mutual destruction. The Canadians tried to sell the arrow to the United Kingdom and the United States, because the arrow showed promising performance and it was more advanced than anything else in the sky. But the British had the Lightning, and the Americans had their own fighter programs. Faced with the high cost of the Bomark and the lack of export customers for the Arrow, the Canadian government on the 20th of February 1959 decided to cancel the Arrow. All airframes, together with all tooling, jigs and drawings, were ordered to be destroyed. This work was completed in April, and only a north section survived. Almost 15,000 employees at Aero Canada lost their jobs, but Canada still needed a fighter to defend the airspace. The Americans offered a North American F-108, a Mach 3 interceptor that was under development, but in September the project was cancelled. Instead, the Americans offered the F-101 Voodoo fighter. That was an insult to the Canadians. Despite the name, the Voodoo was inferior to the Arrow and the Canadians said no thanks. They felt that they had been betrayed by the neighbors. So what now? The British Lightning didn't have the range. Sweden was neutral, so the Draken was out of the question. And the Mirage was, well, French. The solution will come from an unexpected place. <laughs> Not long after air was broken, a group of Air Force and government officials, led by the Air Commodore, secretly started to investigate the opportunity to purchase aircraft from the Eastern Bloc. This group was later referred to as the Hunter Boys. It did not take long before they had meetings with diplomats and Communist Party officials from the Embassy of the Soviet Union. Nikita Khrushchev, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, found this to be an opportunity to bond ties with Canada. The Soviet Union already had an ally in Cuba, and in the eyes of Khrushchev, Canada was, with free education and healthcare, on the path to becoming a socialist state. In late August of 1959, a delegation of Canadian officials, including the Air Commodore, Top RCAF brass, test pilots and aeronautical experts flew to Tempelhof Airport in West Berlin. From here they were secreted through Checkpoint Charlie and to the East German Air Force Base at Holstorf in Schleswig-Holstein. And here they were given access to the secret MiG-21 with a full demonstration by an up-and-coming Soviet test pilot with the name of Yuri Gagarin. The Canadians were concerned about the MiG's short range but they were very impressed by its acceleration and top speed of Mach 2.05. 
Therefore, in November 1959, the Canadian government signed a contract for the purchase of MiG-21F. In what became known as the Red Hawk program, Canada would, in total secrecy, receive 30 MiG-21 interceptors, straight off the assembly line, as well as spares, technical assistance and training tools and support equipment. It was the largest Soviet-Canadian weapon still since the Landlist program sent Canadian-built Hawker Hurricanes to Russia in the 1940s. It was rumoured that the Soviets were pushing for bases in Yukon and Labrador, but these were never granted. The Canadians needed aircraft and revenge over the Americans, but not Soviet allies. The 441 Squadron was selected for the Red Hawk program because of the many experienced pilots in the squadron. Over the next three months, 30 shiny new MiGs were selected from the line at the Mikoyan plant outside Moscow. These assembled, crated and shipped by railcar to the White Sea port over Severodvinsk, where they, under the cover of darkness, were loaded onto Russian cargo ships. One by one, the vessels left the harbour and set course north and then west over the top of Norway and out to the open sea, bound for the east coast of Canada. Each ship was secretly shadowed by a Russian submarine all the way. Under the cover of darkness and with tight security measures, the crates were offloaded at the port of Bratorst in New Brunswick and loaded onto flat cars. The shoulder cars were then sent south to RCAF station Chatham, where under airtight security, Mikoyan technicians supervised the reassembly of the fighters as they arrived. And all the labels in the cockpit were translated to English. Two of the aircraft with tandem seat trainers and a team of four instructors from the East German Air Force carried out nighttime flight training with the pilots of 451 Squadron. The Royal Canadian Air Force had decided to call the fighter the CF-121 Red Hawk with the call sign Red Fox. But the more creative squadron pilots nicknamed it the Stratocaster or the Strat, a name that paralleled the German instructors who called it the Balalaika. The flight training proceeded rapidly, and on the 23rd of June 1960, the first 18 MiGs were ferried via several refueling stops to the home base in Cold Lake, Alberta. The remaining 12 aircraft were kept in storage at Chatham. The ferry flights went well, except for one incident during approach to St. Hubert near Montreal for refueling. The MiGs kept radio silence all the way, but the radio operator, who had not been informed about the arrival of the MiGs, scrambled two CF-100 fighters to intercept the fast approaching aircraft. An aviation enthusiast managed to take a photo of the CF-100 taking off as one of the MiGs was circling overhead. Shortly after, the military police confiscated the camera and the photographer will not get it back. And this photo will not be published until the story broke in the press later that summer. This picture shows one of the Red Hawks taxi in after landing at Cold Lake. The aircraft already have the 441 Squadron's checkerboard pattern on the tail, and later on the aircraft will receive a red lightning flash painted along the fuselage. Cold Lake is located close to Pimrose Air Weapons Range, a vast playground far from populated areas. The pilots enjoy the mix handling and rocket-like acceleration, and they love the low-altitude supersonic dashes they made just above the treetops. What I didn't like was the poor rearward visibility and above all the short time aloft when the afterburners were lit. The Canadians know it was just a matter of time before the United States learned about the Red Hawk program. In fact, they were surprised that they had managed to keep a lid on it so long as they did. Anyway, it was decided to give the Red Hawk a public debut at Canadian National Air Show in Toronto on 11th of September 1960. But just one week before that, an American serviceman on a camping trip to Alberta managed to snap a picture of the four Red Hawks in tight formation as they were practicing for the air show. It didn't take long before the photograph was pasted onto every front page of every newspaper in North America and Europe. The security focus for the United States turned 180 degrees from Cuba to Canada in just one day. For the next week, U-2 flights were ordered day and night over Canadian military bases, 
and Canada was not able to stop them. US National Guard units from Maine to Montana were mobilized and infantry units, mechanized units and Burmark missile batteries began to pile up along the 49th parallel. President Eisenhower was mad, to say the least. In October, the United States sent a delegation that included members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of State, to Ottawa. And they laid out a simple two-point ultimatum. One, get rid of the MiGs by February 1961. And two, sack those responsible. Canada, as Canadians do, promised to have a feasibility study done, but first we'll have to create a parliamentary inquiry. Just as soon as the members of the parliament got back from their Christmas uh, holiday, which began on November 3rd and ran until January 16th. Then they will look into the matter and most likely create an ombudsman who will look after American complaints of this nature. Once that person is chosen and a budget approved, work could begin on designing a process for assuming compliance with national communication standards as outlined by Treasury Board. Then and only then could headway be made into addressing the shape and size of the meeting table and sitting plate for delegates from both countries. Once all the mechanisms were in place to create a transparent process and the highest levels of accountability, mid-level bureaucrats would take over the day-to-day -day mechanics of the process and free politicians to deal with their job, governance and rule of order. This mind-numbing bureaucracy and attention to the minutia of process had the narcotic effect of slowing down the pressure, taking the edge off the wrath and wearing down even bullies like General Curtis Lee May. It also helped that President Kennedy took office in January 1961. By mid-May of 1961, rhetoric was cooling down and deals were struck. If Canada guaranteed the end of the Red Hawk program by mid-summer, the United States would demobilize along the border and allow some American aircraft to be licensed built in Canada. What the Americans wanted was the Canadian market for military aircraft. Canada had at the time one of the largest air forces in the world with scores of large bases from Newfoundland to Vancouver and hundreds of fighter aircraft and hundreds of more utility and transport aircraft. The Canadians eventually accepted the F-101 Voodoo, which became the CF-101. And peace was restored. Though the United States had demanded the immediate withdrawal of all Red Hawks from North American soil, they asked that one CF-121 to be delivered to Edwards Air Force Base in California for test and evaluation. And this was the beginning of the Constant PEG program, which was set up to train US Air Force, Navy and Marine Corps fighter aircraft to fly against Soviet-designed aircraft. Canada returned 27 of the 30 MiGs to the Soviet Union, the Canadians told the Russians that two aircraft had crashed during training. In fact, only one had crash landed when it ran out of fuel, and the other had been secretly sent to the United States. The third airframe was kept as a gate guardian at Cold Lake, where it remained until 1996, when it was replaced with an CF-18 Hornet. The Red Hawk is now under restoration, and later this year it will be displayed next to a full-size replica of the CF-105 Arrow, at the Canadian Air and Space Museum in Toronto. Of the 27 MiGs returned to the Soviet Union, three were delivered to the North Vietnam. Two were shot down by American fighters near Hanoi, and one survives today, in outdoor display at the People's Garden of Suffering and Victory in Hanoi. Sun and Hita weathered their Vietnam markings and brought out the faintest hint of her old Canadian 441 Squadron paint. If you want to learn more about the MiG-21, please check out those videos here. Um, you will find links in the description below. And that's all for this time. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful April Fool's Day and happy learning.